Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Raise your hand if you're in town for ALA. Oh, welcome. So, <laughs> so I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Meg Metcalf. I'm the Women's Gender and LGBTQ Plus Studies Librarian here at the Library of Congress. I am also the chair of LC Globe, which is our employee uh, organization for LGBTQ Plus staff and allies. So we are going to start tonight, I'm going to let folks introduce themselves and briefly tell us about their background, how they come to this topic of LGBTQ activism, and then we're going to have questions and answers when that part is over. So just keep in mind, we are recording, so if you do ask a question, you will be captured on film. So without further ado, welcome to Stonewall 50. Would you like to introduce oh, yourself? certainly. Um, Franklin Robinson, and I am with the National Museum of American History and I work in the Archive Center, and I've been there since, uh, well, I volunteered from 1992, been there on salary since 2000. Um, in addition to LGBTQ, I collect for agriculture, popular entertainment, motion pictures, theater, um, colonial religion. <laughs> I know, it's a mixed bag. Uh, <laughs> how I got into this is um, I saw a lack of my community within the museum's archives, and I decided to try to fix that as best I could. Hi, I'm Lisa Warwick. I come from DC Public Library, our special collections. Um, my job title is Library Coordinator for Reference and Events. Um, it's a job that I just started one year ago, I think in July. Um, so our special collections are trying to collect more unheard DC history, so that is why we're here and trying to collect more in this area. We do have some collections, but we're trying to get more over time. So I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. Also, we are all named Lisa on the panel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> catch up people. So you can either call me Lisa, or if it's confusing, you can call me my name, Shanta Smith-Cruz. You can call me Sean. And I'm here uh, from New York. City, um, which you can imagine right now, is filled with hysteria uh, over Stonewall 50. Um, so the fact that I got here was amazing. But um, I work with the Lesbian History Archives there, which is if, who here has who here has heard of the Lesbian History Archives? But if you haven't, then I'll give you some introduction as to why it's amazing. Um, so we are the longest running, so oldest. Uh, lesbian, collectively run, volunteer run, largest lesbian archive in the world. Um, and it's based in Brooklyn, New York. So I've been a collective member there for 15 years, 20 years, depending on, you know, the start date. And I'm also the co-chair for the Center for LGBTQ Studies, which is at the CUNY Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Um, and that is the oldest and first um, LGBT academic research center which is, um, was started by Martin Duberman. Oh. Very, it was started in the, well, long history of his beginning, but it, I guess you could say it started in the early 90s, late 80s, sometime around that time. LHA started in 1974. And um, what I'm sort of doing a lot of promotion for in the last couple of years is the acquisition of the Salsa Soul Sisters collection, which is the first um, lesbian of color organization in the country, primarily African ancestral lesbians, so black and Latina lesbians, although I can answer questions that have to do with the Lesbian History Archives collections <coughs> in general. And I'm also a librarian um, at the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm the head of reference and an assistant professor there, so I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Meg, and I have lots to say, lots to answer. Not that much to say about Stonewall, but like, you know, I'm from New York, so I have to represent, so I can like do my best. Right. Absolutely, well, great. Uh, and my name is Jake Newsom, and I manage the college student leadership initiatives at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, so in, in that capacity, I work with college students across the country um, to study not only the history of the Holocaust, uh, but also its contemporary lessons uh, for today's life. Um, but when in, in my other, uh, wearing my other hat, um, I am a scholar of LGBT history. 
um, of, um, of American and, and German LGBT history. Um, and so my work focuses on the experiences of the LGBT community uh, during the Holocaust, but also in Germany after the Holocaust. Um, and then uh, uh, it's essentially, it's, it's tie-in with the um, inspiration of Holocaust history and Holocaust memories and the role that it played in gay rights activism. Um, and so I, I guess I'm the only one on here that's not a librarian or a uh, archivist. Um, but that is, yeah, that's how I'll be able to, you know, contribute to this conversation is connecting uh, the history of the Holocaust with uh, American gay rights activism. Excellent. Thank you so much. And actually, your introduction reminds me of something we were actually discussing right before the panel, which is most of the time, as a librarian, just speaking for myself, uh, most of the time you encounter people who are aware of these resources, these primary resources we're going to be talking about today of LGBTQ plus history, most of the time they are historians, right? Or they are not necessarily members of the LGBTQ plus community. And I'm wondering if you all have had similar experiences with that where we're finding, you know, more often people in the community aren't aware of their history. It's more a, more a scholar or more a look from above or more academia would be a place where that would be more more fluid. So is, have you guys also had that experience? Uh, yeah, um, at, we, we have, um, we are fully open archives. We take mm -hmm. appointments open five days a week. So I can say yes, we've definitely had people who are not members of the LGBTQ community come in to study the collections because of, let's say, conversion therapy, um, mm -hmm. social history, use of urban spaces. Um, it's a it's quite fascinating the, the amazing things that you can pull out of some of these collections so so yes yeah. in answer to your question yeah. yeah for us it's a lot of researchers and so we've been trying to do more things in the community that will make our collections a little more accessible mm -hmm. um, they're not all officially approved but I'm going to talk about them anyway <laughs> so we're having a, a monthly panel series on LGBTQ history in DC Starting with the first one on July, I'm going to have to look at my notes. Good librarian with your mm -hmm. notes. References. July 25th at Cleveland Park Library, and then another one on August 24th at Mount Pleasant Library, um, and another one on September 17th um, that's going to be all of the founding members of the Sapphire Sapphos, which we're really excited oh, about. Wow. Um, and then we're also going to do... This just got approved, so I'm allowed to talk about it some. We're going to do a voguing ball at yes. the in September. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so there are handouts with our websites. All of the details on that will be listed later on. Wow, a voguing workshop. <laughs> um, and don't you also have a panel coming up on the 21st as well? August 21st? No, that's a different one. 24th. Which one am I on? <laughs> 24th. Oh, it's the 24th. Okay. Thank yeah. goodness we cleared that up, right? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay. Good to know. Okay. So, any other comments on that specifically? Well, I guess I would have to say that in my uh, case, as you know, being the researcher going into these, trying to find these archives, mm -hmm. um, I found it quite to actually be the opposite. Right, that I was going into these archives that you know normally hold all of the the material on you know ho Holocaust records, um, and going in and saying I, I want to be able to find uh, you know information on this particular victim group. I want to I want to know about gay concentration camp survivors. Uh, what were what were the Nazis' policies against uh, gays and lesbians? Uh, and archivists there being like. Mm. I don't really think we have anything oh. about that on here. Oh. You know, we only do like real Holocaust stuff. Um, ah. And so what I ended up having to do was, you know, spend time uh, going across Germany uh, and visiting these local volunteer-led grassroots community center mm -hmm. archive libraries, right, um, where it was members of the community themselves mm -hmm. finding and documenting uh, th this this history. Um, and so without, you know, the, the passion and the work and the dedication of those those archivists who, you know, were really just archivists on the weekends or at, at work, you know, after work, um, you know, I, clearly like none of, none of my work would have been possible or, or the work of other other scholars, and I don't, I don't know how many times that literally I would meet someone, they would get off of work, and like we would have a sandwich together really quick, and then go, like, go spend, he would give up his night to spend it in the archives so I could get in yeah. there. Um, and so that's just, it's just really incredible, the, you know, the work of, of um, 
archivists and librarians all over the place. And can I add to that, that in um, this summer you're probably going to be there next weekend in Berlin? There's oh, yeah. the LGBT Alms Conference, so it's an international archivist, librarians, museum, curator, special collections conference for the LGBT community. Oh, cool. And it's happening at, in Berlin next weekend, which I'm not going to. But oh, yeah. I wish. They had it two years ago in London, and I was there. Oh, and it man. was really a lot of people talking about what you're referring to, which is these small community archives, international spaces, yeah. and merging this research ar archival gap that I think yep. exists. Definitely it happens at LHA. And when you think about archives and access, I would say that's a huge question that we mm. have in terms of how are people getting to these collections, right? So when, like at CLAGS, for example, we have this really rich archival history and it's all in file cabinets in the office. Mm. And we're always having funding issues as a sort of like universe, grassroots university center. The university pays for the office space, but not the staff and not anything else. And so even 25 years later, we're still trying to get funding. And a lot of what we do is um, individual donor requests, right? And individual donor um, reach outs and outreach. But most of the money, I think, can exist in the archival material, which I know is controversial and, and unethical. And that's sort of where I am right now mm. in the conversation of access and sustainability and like how do we merge those two things. So one example of that what I'm referring to is the digitization projects that would allow for these materials to leave the shelves and enter an online space so that people can access the materials. And I know that at the Lesbian Herster Archives we've had a series of projects, whether it be through library students uh, digitizing full collections and then putting it online. We've done that with Pratt University Library where we have a full website of Audre Lorde's all her oral histories or all of um, the, I guess, um, of, of audio website, what is it called? I'd have to look it up. But like a full run of audio clips. Oh my gosh, love tapes. The love tapes <laughs> is all online. Um, and so we've had multiple materials put online through the digitization. And then we've also had proprietary digitization projects through Gail um, resources. So I wanted yes. to mention We should talk things. about yeah, that. Yeah, we should talk about <laughs> Gail talk about that. and how things, sort of projects like Gail are sort of moving into this realm of access and potentially in an unethical space. And I should say as a disclaimer that I'm on the Gail Advisory Board for yeah. their LGBT Life Full Text database. So Fun fact, that was yeah. the first database I bought for this library. There you go. Um, but it's really interesting because actually just yesterday, they, um, someone, a researcher, had put a call out on Twitter for this long lost document called the Asexual Manifesto. And all the librarians and archivists were going at it, we and we find it. And we find the reference to it in the Archives of Human Sexuality and Identity. And we see that it's been digitized from the Lesbian History Archives. And now, we have the full text in our hands. Um, so it's really interesting because I think for the longest time, stuff that would be in the Lesbian History Archives or in other community archives would never be accessible um, because they would not have the, fu the funds to digitize it themselves. So this option of Gale or another database or another publisher coming in and digitizing it for us is also very enticing. But then again, it's behind a paywall. So what are the ethics of that? Um, yeah, I think that's really a really interesting question. Um, so how does it work? Um, do, do you guys know when people, so they digitize your collections. So do you guys have data or information on who's accessing what once, you've, once it's been digitized? We might. If we want. might. We don't want to know. <laughs> we I don't want to know. <laughs> I think access in libraries is a real question. Like the, uh, the consideration of how a lot of queer people have entered libraries has often been about us going in and like hiding in a mm -hmm. shelf, right? Mm -hmm. Finding an HQ or whatever mm -hmm. the Dewey <laughs> equivalent is. And when your parent isn't looking, you like look for that one text, right? And then you come out to yourself and that's like most of our coming out stories happens in libraries yes. if we're like queer librarians. In fact, at least that's my gathering, right? Oh, I hear some so, yeses from the audience. Many, yes. Right? Like relating to that moment where you like picked up Ruby Fruit Jungle, you're like, oh my God, this is what I always look for. And so when you think of like libraries and privacy and yeah. access, it's all, it's all very complicated when you add a queer lens to it. Mm -hmm. And so when archives enter that space, we have to think about, well, you know, the Lesbian Archive Archive is open to any lesbian. You don't have to give any credentials. You don't have to give a reason. You don't even have to kiss me when you walk through, although it's okay <laughs> to do. But as long as you want to and say you identify as wanting to see the collection, then you can. 
So it's in that way completely accessible, but if you're not able to be in the space, then it's not accessible. So there's those questions of access and what mm -hmm. the ethics are of that. Yeah. Um, and then there's the question of, you know, turf gem and like access oh. in that relationship mm -hmm. as it relates to queer spaces and turf um, refers to trans exclusive radical, radical feminism. feminism. Um, which comes up when you, people say lesbian or stalker. The first question is, well, are you accessible to every, you know, and then we have to like talk about it. But so access is a big question. And so then I would say it's something to, to consider and think about. Mm -hmm. And money is a big question too. Mm -hmm. And we got, a, I don't know, we're being recorded, but I would say that the, the royalties <laughs> for the Gale database has to a point led to a sustainable, you know, archive yeah. in a way that we hadn't anticipated. So if it can be reciprocal like that, that's a, yeah. hopefully a positive thing for the future. But yeah, I definitely never envisioned publishers coming into the queer community archive that I was at, the Queer Zine Archive Project. I would never in a million years have imagined that that would be an option for us. Um, but I'm curious for our other panelists, have you had any digitization efforts or been involved with any um, digitization efforts and have there been any ethical considerations with that and with outing people? You want to go? In order. Uh, <laughs> Which piece is yeah, okay. it? So um, we digitize on demand, and we don't. Yeah. So, but there is a cost for that. Oh, I mean, okay. If it's something very simple, there's usually um, no cost to that. It's something that the reference librarian can do right at the desk. We're good with that. But if it's like a folder more than that, then it would be then you have to actually pay for the digitization and actually uploading it to the dams and all that stuff. But the other, the big initiative that um, the Smithsonian Museum of American History and the One Archive have going on is what we call right now is the um, LGBTQ Digital Hub. And um, that's being developed by One the Smithsonian and Stanford University. And that's going to be open access um, with the caveat. And Bob Horton, who is my the big boss, he can speak to this much better than I can because he's the one working it through. Um, but that, that would be basically a hub where smaller institutions can actually put their materials and it would be sort of like the gay Google in a way, is the, is the way I envision it anyway. And, um, but there would actually be, the controls would be put on by that repository. So it's not wow. a one size fits all. So let's say if the Her Story Archiv Archives wants to put their material up and they say, oh well, this is only available to people we allow to see it, or but this is, everybody can see it, then that's, that is the way that we're envisioning it, is that there's a lot of control by the local institution, um, or the local individual even. And we want to make it so robust that actually someone, let's say, sitting at home saying, oh, you know, they're saying that this happened in, you know, June of 1969, but no, 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 I was there. And, you know, they can type in their comments and add that up. You know, there's no vetting process. It's, it's on the researcher to, you know, follow that through to make sure that what they're saying is, is accurate. But there's no kind of policing on there. So that's kind of where we are with digitization, um, at least at at the Archive Center. Is there a potential launch date for that or not yet too early? Um, well, the good thing is is that we are, it was a three-phase process um, and Comcast has been very good about actually helping to fund it in addition to one going out. Yeah, it's been, wow. it's really, it's taken off much quicker than we ever thought. So it is now in development, the prototype. So we're hoping maybe 2020, keeping our fingers crossed, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I just um, I, I don't think there's anything. There's nothing on our website because one is the primary um, mover and shaker, simply because we're quasi federal and we can't go out for grant money. Um, we can ask for money, but we can't go out for grants. But they can. So that's yeah. kind of where we're at. So we're, we're thinking 2020. Yeah. So yeah. And you have a full collection of one, a full run. We of do. One. We have a full. We're and, talking about one magazine, yeah. the first uh, gay publication yeah. or periodical in the United States. And then we have a full run of the Mattachine Review mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. As do we. So. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I, I was going to say. Yeah. Want to start yeah. fighting about this? <laughs> All right, Lisa. And what about the ladder? <laughs> what about the ladder, we, Lisa? <laughs> Do you have the ladder? I don't know. We do have the ladder. Okay. Now, if I don't know, I don't. We're know. just gonna do this for the rest of the time. Do you okay. have transvestia? No, but we have turnabout. <laughs> All right. Okay. We're do you have now. drag? No, but yes. Dra you do I, not have drag. I do. I have, and I actually have a full run of the drag rag. Do you? <laughs> Well, I guess I'll just have to come see you then. Please do. All right. Digitize, put that in LGBTQ Hub. That's right. Although, yeah. shout out to the Digital Transgender Archive yeah. because they've digitized oh, drag, yeah. turnabout, and I don't know if they've digitized transvestia or not, um, but I do know those two for sure. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Let's keep yeah. fighting. No. Yeah. Sorry, no, right. <laughs> They'll know exactly what we've got by the time we finish, right? Exactly. <laughs> 
Any other digital projects anybody wants to pitch or talk about? Um, I don't have all of those. Okay. That's okay. okay. We don't have, any, right. we don't have to it's get into it. It's not a competition, it. right? It's okay. Not among Lisa. That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> never. So our biggest digitization project right now is the Washington Blade. So mm -hmm. we are we do have the full run of that. We've digitized up to 1993, and we plan to have the rest done with the, in the next year or two. And we just got um, the full run of Women in the Life. Um, and it's it runs from 1993 to 2003, and we're going to start digitizing that next year. Wow. And then yeah. this will just all be accessible on your website. Yep. dc.dclibrary.org. Awesome. Um, all of that will be free and open to the public. We have had some concerns with digitizing. Mm. With um, In the Punk Archive, we have zine, a zine collection, and there are a few things that you can see if you're at a library on one of our connected computers, but you can't see from home. I totally, I totally forgot to mention um, um, SOVA, S-O-V-A dot S-I dot E-D-U, which is our um, search engine with across the institution. And if, uh, at least within the American History Archives, if something has been digitized, that's linked to the folder uh, on the website. So let's say if you want to, you know, go to sova.si.edu, look up lesbian, it'll pull anything that has that keyword in it across the institution. So let's say the portrait gallery has something, um, uh, uh, American Indian might have something, you know, we have something, it'll bring all that up. At least on ours, if we've digitized, let's say someone asked for a photograph, whatever, um, you can click on that and you can actually see the image. So I totally forgot about that part. Yeah. That's amazing. I was just taking notes, sorry. Oh, you're just oh. taking notes. <laughs> All right. So another popular topic that's been um, coming up a lot recently is hidden histories, invisible histories. And I feel like a lot of LGBTQ history is hidden. Um, but, you know, this is 50 years of Stonewall. We're talking about, you know, this, this turning point in the LGBTQ historical narrative, or so people say. Um, but does it obscure things? Is it hiding things? What does this focus on Stonewall not allow us to see, and I'm wondering if there's anything, any hidden histories in your own collections you'd like to share. Um, I'll tell a story that kind of ties into the access <laughs> piece. So when I was getting ready for this talk, I was looking for our copies of Blacklight, which hmm. is um, a gay black periodical that ran in the late 70s, and we just have a few years of it, and so it's in this miscellaneous box. And while I was going through, I found two issues of something called Breadbox that said it's a gay revolutionary workers oh God. handout. Wow. And it was, it's completely hidden in our collection. It's in a, unless you knew it was there, you wouldn't know. Or unless you came in and said there was this thing called Breadbox. And in tiny print on the bottom, it said, it says something like, you can find these. These will be handed out every 10 days in these locations. <laughs> we have two of them. And you just know that wow. there are tons of them yeah. somewhere. Um, those are the kinds of things that get hidden in our collections. And I think mm -hmm. those are also like focusing on DC history. Everything that was going on before kind of gets swept under the rug a little bit. Definitely. Before Stonewall. Yeah. Before Stonewall, what was happening then? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when you mentioned hidden history, for me, what, what that calls to mind is, let's say, within a lot of our collections that were collected maybe for another purpose or another reason, mm -hmm. you know, and suppose, let's say, one of the, the persons in there belonged to the community but was either not out or it's not generally known. We have a huge mm -hmm. photograph collection. Um, Sultner Wells is his last name. I cannot remember his first name. But anyway, he used to do le lecture talks around the country on his travels, you know, for, you know, the ladies at lunch and all that nonsense. And uh, excuse me hey. for anybody who does that, sorry. Uh, so, so come to find out, one day, somebody kind of came into my office and said, um, you do know that Sultner Wells is gay. And I'm like, what? He said, he said he, it's not generally known, but he was gay. And I said, okay, I said, is that you saying it? Or he goes, no, there's that secret box. And I'm like, oh. I said, what box is that? And he goes, I'm not supposed to tell you, but it just happens to be box 25, range for the other. <laughs> and sure enough, there, I mean, it, within his photographs, there's photographs that are definitely gay related. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, so, yeah, so, so that, that is kind of the hidden history there. And how, and that's, this discussion came up actually last night. We, um, 
Was anybody at the viewing for um, Beyond Stonewall? Awesome, very good. Um, so, which is running on the, do my little commercial now, the Smithsonian Channel, uh, Monday evening at 8 and at 10. And in fact, it kind of touches on some of these <laughs> hidden histories, but one of the questions that came up was um, Charlotte Cushman, who was a very famous actress in the 19th century. Do you know her? Who has her papers? Would it be us? Well, <laughs> you We do. You do? Oh. Yes, we do. <laughs> oh, see, who she, just, an she has on a her? Real, real man on that one, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Okay. I'm sorry, Lisa. We so, really need to stop this. So, but it came up as to how do you how do you let people know that when she herself did not necessarily self well, of course, right. the term gay was not even in use then. Self identify as a lesbian, or she may have self identified as a lesbian in her private life, but she never wanted it known outside. So, yeah. so there there was the tug of war in the sense of so do we put that on the label and then that becomes the be all and end all of why she's known or is she she's certainly known for her prowess as an actor um so so that's kind of the, the 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 issue with hidden histories and kind of tagging things that we do come across in the archives that aren't weren't not necessarily collected because of their lgbtq content so. yeah you don't want to out people no, well that's I mean, yes or do that's, you? Or don't you? well yet again that's for at least for us it, we always presume that that after death there is no presumption of privacy is, is our standard policy. So I don't know what it is here. So, so let's say um, you know some of the material that has come from eBay that is definitely gay content and has people in it that sometimes I do know who they are in the sense because because the people that sold it said oh that's Joe that's so and so and so and so they're long since dead. You know I I that's who it is and that's part of their story. Um, that's the way I look at it in the sense of these people would probably, this, this material would end up in the dustbin somewhere if it had not been for this person trying to make a buck off of it and me you know, haunting eBay that day and saving it. So I figure in some ways I'm, I'm trying to actually you know, you know, give them a life or make their life meaningful in, in some way in the sense that it informs um, archival and historians. So, 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 so yes, we out them if they're if they've passed, and if if, if they were obviously out in their life, um, then, then 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 we do. Yeah. But but we wouldn't necessarily do it for somebody living, of course. Well, I know Cushman has a lot of <coughs> modern lesbian fans, so oh, I yeah. feel like she's fairly out now. That's what. Yeah. 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 It's funny that you mentioned eBay because LHA has collect everything that we have is volunteer only, or I'm sorry, <laughs> donated. So we don't really solicit, except for one collection. And so we oh, got really? it on eBay. And it was the New York City run of the Daughters of Blytus' uh, mm, library. Wait a minute. Yeah. And they had How on many eBay, volumes? Um, it, I think there's like, I don't actually know the number. Mm. It takes up about a certain number of square feet in a Brooklyn house. <laughs> it's, not, it's not small. But I actually wanted to know if I could show something. I would love because, that. Um, it only takes like three minutes because I was like, "Do we? Are we going to do this?" And it was a whole conversation. I think I'm. I'm glad and we're I think doing it's it. okay, but it's yeah. only going to take a few minutes. So ultimately, I created a bitly, so it's easy to get to. So we'll see if it's true. But ultimately, I feel like all lesbian history is hidden history. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can if I did this right. No, I didn't. I don't know who that is. Um, <laughs> Let's try that again. If it's not going to work, then I apologize. Uh, so what I'm going to show is ultimately um, a few projects that we, oh my goodness. All right, it's fine. I'll just go through it directly. Um, so firstly, the Lesbian History Archives, we are about to launch a new website. If you've been to our website, I apologize. It's been that way for the past 20 years, and it's hard to get to. But we're just about to launch this one, and so you're seeing it fresh off the stage. Um, so it's still in draft mode, um, so don't be attached to what you see. But um, ultim ultimately, it's going to look something like this, where you can look for our digital collections and get to them. And then you can find out the other collections we have and see more information on them. That's our facade, who people haven't seen it. Um, and the digital collections that I was referring to were those that are um, digitized by Pratt Sills, the Pratt University Library, and we have Audre Lord, Boots of Leather, Silver of Gold, mm. others. Mm. Um, and I don't know why my bit.ly didn't work, but the, the hidden history that I wanted to show was the, the Salsa Soul Sisters, um, and also a Vice article, which I can't get to now. But 
Blackburn. No, I'll just do the Vice article. Google, help me out. <laughs> yes. There we go. So um, we just got this article published, or this person, Oriana Lecker, just got this article published. Um, but it's about, it's sort of like whenever we do hidden histories of lesbians, we have to give like lesbian history and then say, oh, here are some things that relate to that. So this is an example of that. So a lot of what we do is we don't collect anyone who's um, famous, or we do, we collect famous lesbians, but we don't make that a requirement for having our, their materials. So ultimately, so we like to focus on the everyday dyke and anybody who, who's interested in documenting themselves and excuse the ads, it's Vice Magazine. Um, so this is <laughs> Mabel Hampton and her partner, Lillian Faderman. Wait, no, sorry. That's not, that's not her partner's name. I'll come back to her partner's name. Um, a lot of these um, photos are by Saskia Sheffer, one of our collective members. So we have the full run of the ladder. I was trying to mention when you guys were doing the war. Okay. <laughs> um, but alongside that, we also have things that are sort of obscure. And so one obscure art, um, object that we chose for this article was the Japanese Dictionary, hmm. which is um, wow. sort of like a collection of text that was transcribed in Japan and Japanese as well as English throughout the whole dictionary. So here's an example of what that would look like. So here's the header on both sides and one side is English and the other side is not in English, it's, it's in Japanese. Um, and it's a way to sort of like translate what it is to be a lesbian in, in Japan um, for I guess people who are traveling there. I don't know who would use it necessarily, wow. but uh, the Japanese dictionary is an example of like the kind of things that we have and it was created in 1989. So, um, we have things of that sort of obscure yeah. nature. We also have, we have hundreds and hundreds of t-shirts and I thousands of buttons. And so all of those are sort of like very obscure because lesbians like to make t-shirts and buttons during the yeah. of organizing. <laughs> and they don't necessarily have the provenance of, uh, you know, an so object exciting. that's <laughs> given by a person with their name and who's like, we don't know if that's Sarah Shulman's Lavender Menace t-shirt or Maxine uh. Wolf's, but we just know it's a t-shirt that's Lavender Menace. We don't know whose sweat is on it, but we don't wash it. <laughs> So, but we do like to tell the stories around them. So this one is sort of re remembering Rita Mae Brown, who also who did yeah. the book that we referred to. But um, she was also an activist, and so when she led a group of women in collective action, um, this was an example of what that would look like through the T-shirt. Um, and then we have so here's Mabel again. What's her partner's name? Oh, I don't have it. I'm sorry, I have a bad memory, I'm getting older. Lillian Foster, and I said Faderman. There's Lillian Foster and Mabel. So Mabel is one of the women who we sort of have as an icon because she was the first elder of the organization when all of the women who started it in the 70s were in their 40s, I guess you could say. Mabel was the elder woman who then passed and they sort of took her story and the way to promote her story as an example of what the archive's purpose was. And so, um, although Mabel had been out all her life and she was a dancer in Harlem and she was out since the 1920s. She's an example of what was going on in the city before Stonewall. Um, she donated a lot of the pulps in the, um, in the collection. She also um, was the co-founder's nanny, which is an interesting conversation about race in the archives and how that plays a role. And then in her later life, this, that co-founder became Mabel's caretaker when Mabel was um, at the end of her life. And so it sort of is this interesting um, queering of the way racial relations exist in New York, which I think is, I like that story a lot. So that was just an example. I was going to show um, stuff on salsa, but I can come back to that. But I just wanted to give some visuals while I was here. I like those visuals. And, and like show you the new website so I can encourage the coordinators to let's launch it instead of having more <laughs> meetings about it. <laughs> so I shouldn't ask if there's a projected launch date then. Oh my god, two weeks ago. <laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, so I have, I have um, yeah, a story about, about hidden histories and uh, particularly um, access to, or th this question, um, you know, when we, when we use terms like hidden history mm -hmm. or uh, invisible histories, I think we always have to ask ourselves, like, hidden from whom or invisible to mm -hmm. whom, right? Um, and so when I was, uh, so as an undergraduate, I became interested in the history of the Holocaust. I took all the, the courses at my you know, university um, over the course of several years. But it wasn't until the very, very last semester uh, that a guest speaker came uh, onto campus and gave a talk about 
uh, and the title was The Men with the Pink Triangle, right? And that, so it was talking about uh, gay Holocaust um, victims and gay Holocaust survivors. Um, and I remember thinking at, as, I, as I was there, how did I study this topic intentionally for four years mm -hmm. and never learn about this particular group? Um, and but also kind of having a moment of, of kind of anger at myself that especially you know, as, as a gay man, studying this history, why did, not, why did I never stop to think, to ask these questions about where are these people uh, in, in this particular history? Uh, and so when I went on to graduate school and decided this is what I'm going to study, you know, I'm going to um, tell, tell the story, um, essentially, you know, the potential advisors, professors all told me, well, there's nothing to know about it. Like, you know, it was such, there was such an um, era of um, homophobia that even the survivors didn't want to talk about it. No one wanted to talk about it. And as a result, there's just this complete lack of information. So, you know, good luck, but you're not going to find anything. So, of course, you know, me being, like, young and idealistic, I was like, don't worry, I'm going to find <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yes. And so I go to the archives thinking that I'm, I'm going to find nothing. Um, right? But then, so whenever I do find those small kind of volunteer-led archives, mm -hmm. um, you know, being absolutely surprised to find mountains and mountains of material, um, right? That if, if by gay Holocaust survivors themselves, mm -hmm. uh, by the local uh, West German press, um, by West German politicians and law lawyers and judges, all talking about uh, the fate of gay people under uh, under the Third Reich, right? And so um, it really made me question then, like. Is, was there ever really a silence, right? And, and, and what does silence mean? Mm -hmm. um, because I think, on the one hand, silence means like a lack of something, right? A lack of information or a lack of noise. Uh, but clearly, silence can also be a verb, right? And, and something can be silenced. Uh, and clearly, that was, that was the case with this particular history, is that um, it, was, it wasn't a lack of information. It wasn't a lack of, of knowledge at all. But it was essentially a people with power, whether they were the politicians or the historians writing you know, the official history saying this is not worth knowing, it's not worth remembering, and it's not worth acknowledging as you know, real history. Um, and so I, I think keeping that in mind as we talk about what, what is hidden history is that um, someone hid it, on, on, right. on, usually in, on, on purpose. Right, right, right. right. I really like that, silence of the verb. Mm. Sorry, I'm German, but I just have to say <laughs> that that's exactly the same experience I have with black lesbian researchers. Mm. And it's the reason why I continue to do the work that I do, because initially people would, everyone who comes to the archives is either a doctoral student mm -hmm. or, or the people that come to me, they're doctoral student researchers. They have to uncover this unknown history, this hidden history, yeah. and they come expecting to find nothing. Mm -hmm. and. I'm talking 10 years already at this point where people say, you know, there must have been nothing. And in fact, yeah. there was a conference, a Lesbians in the 70s conference hmm. in 2000. And I was the, one of the coordinators for it. It was done through CLAGS. And even the coordinating committee, we sat in a circle. It was like a call put out throughout the country. Anyone who was a lesbian in the 70s, come join this listserv. <laughs> and so then just imagine like 70 lesbians who were around during the 70s on this list server, you could imagine all the ex-girlfriends and all the like towns. Uh, yeah. That was really like tumultuous, but then when we finally got to planning, we said, all right, we have to meet in person. There's too much arguing mm -hmm. on this list server. So whoever's in New York, <laughs> come into this room. So then it went down to maybe like 20 people, right? So the 20 women gather in this room, and they're all excited to be there, and they're like, how are we going to plan this conference? What are we going to do? And it was only myself and one other woman in the room that was black, but that woman was also not around mm. in the 70s. And so when the question was, all right, so do we include the theater women? Do we include WOW? Do we include everyone sort of, they were in agreement. And then they said, well, what about the lesbians of color? And everyone went, well, you know, there weren't really any lesbians of color in the 70s. <laughs> oh, and there were two lesbians of color in the room that went, we don't know, maybe they're right. Maybe there's, so they were like, well, just call Cheryl Clark, she'll do something. Uh -huh. And that was the end of it. And so then it wasn't until I went to the archive that I opened the box and found that there was just this unbelievable amount of material, right, of all of this work happening in the 70s, that I realized, oh, this, was, um, this is a, a silence that's being sort of like perpetuated, right? And even, so then we had an event. We had, I had sort of like this huge event. There was a zine, there were, there was, there were two events, hundreds of women came, and we put one of the original Salsa board members on the panel. And then 
So fast forward five years later, I'm doing a book chapter for this Audre Lorde collection where Audre Lorde's last partner puts together this book chapter. Uh, or she puts in this book. She asks for the Salsa Soul women to put together a chapter on Audre and Salsa. I'm recording the conversation. We're all there. We do the chapter. We're talking. We're, or we're oral historying it. You know, it's in LHA. And then finally I say, so tell me about, like, you know, what's happening now and, you know, how Audre Lorde is. She goes, well, you know, there's so, we don't, nobody wants to, um, acknowledge that we were there. We were always at the table. Clags did this conference in 2010, and there were no black lesbians at the conference. And I had to say, wait, Imani, stop. You were at the conference. <laughs> you were on the panel. Well, how could you say that? And it just, it just continues. It's like this, this continuous need. So I'm wondering, I guess, it's like, did you find that the, the, the Jewish scholars, the Jewish collective archivists, were also sort of like permeating the silence, too? Or the people who were there are constantly talking about the silence? Because I think the silence. Mm is a burden that is a verb that we all pr perpetuate. It's like this conversation yeah, about racism true, or, yeah. or Me Too, whatever it is. Like, there comes a point where if it's being taken care of, we have to stop acting as if it's there. You know, the conversation has changed. So anyhow, this is a long rant. I'm so sorry, but it's no, definitely it's on my mind. And I, I have so many curiosities, but I'm going to use the verb as an example of what that could look like. Well, I think, you know, it's just really interesting because you're, you're right. I mean, you raise a really great point that that silencing or the, the the narrative of silence isn't can, can also be perpetuated by the community like itself, um, and so really, if you're reading any, for example, any article or book on um, uh, gay Holocaust experiences, essentially, I mean, you can bet that the first sentence is going to be, "No one knows about this history. <laughs> nothing has been written on it." And well, actually, like, I have a list of like 95 <laughs> published, you know, things that have been written on it, but. Um, but so yeah, this idea, you know, and it kind of makes me wonder: is it is it a, also a um, an idea of legitimacy, right? That that you know, you you're trying to un, undo the silence, and so you need there to be silence, kind of first to to, to break it. Um, and so yeah, I think that's it's it is it's interesting to think about. <laughs> yeah. Since we're on tape and people can just rewind, I'm going to take back the thing I said about and DC Public Library doesn't have a lot on this. See? <laughs> it is one of our largest digital collections, and I'm going to stop saying that now. <laughs> yeah, talk about abundance instead of lack. And mm -hmm. Maybe after Stonewall, because I'm wondering what the Stonewall 50 effect mm -hmm. will be. Right. Now, yes. Right. Like yes. Maybe that'll be the effect right. that there's now. The world has been stonewalled. Well, <laughs> but you know, I always talk yeah. about the archival closet in the sense that, in order to kind of mitigate this silence, people have to give up the stuff. You know, how many donors have I talked to that you know? Oh, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this, and I'm like, oh, that's great. Do you have like you know journals, diaries, because that's primary source? Oh, well, mm, you really wouldn't want that, would you? And I'm like, oh yeah, because. Well, Definitely. I don't know if I'm ready to give that up, which I totally understand. But at the same time, if you want to mitigate it, mitigate what is not there, mm -hmm. we have you have to give it to us. That's yeah. the thing, and, and that's that's the big push. And because, you know, our line is that um, you know, God forbid that something happens to you, and no one knows what you've got or mm -hmm. that it's meaningful, it goes in the dumpster because we got to sell the house. I'm not going through that hard drive. Forget about it. You know, and all that old lesbian stuff in the closet, we're throwing it out because we don't want her to know that she was, you know, it's just, that, that to me is the silence, is, is the community stepping up in the sense of realizing that what you have, your history is valuable. We use that every day in the archives. So all those old materials from like the 70s, you know, 60s, before, you know, that's, and I'm wondering about the Stonewall effect too, if people will start to realize the value of of this material and say like, oh wow, I really do need to think about where do I want this material to go when I am no longer the steward of it. So, so that's, that's my riff on that part. Because we were having a conversation before we began about how during June, but especially this June, anyone who does anything LGBTQ, all the requests come in. So I don't know about y'all, but it's been a busy month, yes. like maybe the busiest Pride Month I've ever had. Um, and I'm hoping that this will be a sustained, you know, this will this will get a lot of research interest and people will want to donate things and start to realize that it's important. So I guess we'll be looking at this video and seeing, oh, were we right about the Stonewall right. effect or not? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, so another question I had for the, for the panelists before we turn it over to the audience would be, so we talked about, so some of us are, so for lesbian history archives, obviously, 
just lesbian stuff. The library, we collect it. Uh, DCPL, we collect it, but it's not all we collect. So I'm curious for the Smithsonian folks in the room, too, especially, do you guys collect specifically LGBTQ, or are they coming in as part of other collections? No, we specifically collect. Okay, great. Yeah, they also Wonderful. can come in with other ones, but we, no, no, no. Catherine Ott and myself are very aggressive at going out trying to you know reach out to anybody that will contact us most of most of our material does come from people who call up and say oh you wouldn't want all of those old fill in the blank and we're like oh yes we would <laughs> yeah yeah um, so you know and, and we're very lucky in the sense that the Smithsonian carries with it you know a little bit of weight so mm. when Catherine calls up you know Bishop Gene Robinson and says you know hey we'd like to collect some stuff he's more apt to talk to us than perhaps somebody else so and we try to we really do try to mitigate that, and we try to be play nice and not, uh, you know, swoop in. But um, better watch out for me. Uh, I'm just I, yeah, I was gonna say, oh, I, oh, you're on my radar now, uh -oh. lady, <laughs> Miss Lisa. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we know we actively go out and, and collect. Um, Are you the only one who's responsible, or you and your? It's just myself colleague? and Catherine. Ott. I mean, okay. it doesn't mean that other people can't collect it. It's same, the but same they here. always, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like if somebody comes in and say, oh, you know, we're collecting. Um, Sab Shimino, which was a very um, Jap Japanese, right, because he was in the internment camp, a very famous actor, uh, played um, Ito and Auntie Mayim on Broadway and did numerous things in motion pictures, still is alive. He and his lover, uh, actually and a husband now, live in California. Um, that was actually collected at, for his career, but the side story was, of course, that he happens to be gay, so they came downstairs and said, oh, hey, would you know, you, would you support this acquisition? I'm like, Yes, so um, so that all comes in, you know, and that's part of the, the papers there that you can research. That's not the primary reason why he was collected, but that's kind of an example of, you know, you know, the gravy coming with the mashed potatoes. Yeah, because for the Library of Congress, of course, we were collecting LGBTQ items, but it was not an official area until the '90s, um, after some sustained effort on the part of LC Globe. So I'm just also interested to see when LGBTQ collecting came online in these various. I mean, LHA is pretty obvious, but so um, for the Holocaust Museum, do you specifically collect LGBTQ, or is it more coming in with other collections? So I would say it. it Especially, I mean, up to this point, um, and after the fall of the Soviet Union, when all of these kind of Eastern archives opened up, um, I mean, we just got flooded with. I mean, just it, we were just taking anything and everything, oh, wow. yeah. uh, and so you know, it just then was a matter of our archivists and librarians sorting through what we found, uh, what we got, um, and to be able to then start tagging what yeah. what we actually had, um, and so it's really you know up until um, recently, I'll say that last five or ten years when we've now been able to um, kind of catch our breath and say we're going to really now be targeted in um, trying to acquire specific either topics or specific types of, of material. Um, and one of those is, um, uh, you know, the LGBT uh, related material. Um, but it's, it's incredibly hard because, um, I mean, as, as is probably the case with, with a lot of our work, um, people didn't want to, gay people or people in the community didn't want to leave a trace behind, right? right? Because especially in Germany, there was this really harsh national law. Uh, and so really everything that we, almost everything that we get is all through the eyes of the Nazis themselves, mm -hmm. uh, which is incredibly problematic, right? right. Um, uh, and so trying, being able to uh, try to, to look at those documents within cross-reference, do we have you know, other, other information on these people who might be on what they call pink lists, um, you know, poses its own, own challenge. And so, um, so yeah, so even, even as we can, now we're trying to think of ways, well, how can we find LGBT sources when LGBT people themselves didn't want to be found? Yeah. Right, right. right. And just a follow-up for you, because I'm curious for the German connection. Um, do you know, does your institution have anything that would have been at the Hirschfeld archives? Because we have here at the Library of Congress, we do have a lot of the annual reports from the Early Sexology Institute. So I'm wondering if that would be something that you would have. So we do have some. Um, we, from the beginning, uh, really tried to set boundaries on like 1933 to 1945 uh, so that it would be somewhat manageable. Um, but in, in, <laughs> Sorry. says, says, I, right, I know that, uh, <laughs> um, but we, we, we do have a lot of, we, Hirschfeld stuff kind of by accident, um, 
and we have some too, really, basically. really interesting stuff. But I think one reason yeah. we, <laughs> that we have it is because, um, and this is one thing that maybe a lot of people don't know, is that you know, the, the Nazi book burnings um, mm. is, a, is a famous um, incident yeah. from Nazi history, right? But uh, Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Sciences was one of the key targets right. of that. Uh, and so, you know, we know that over that night, over the course of two or three days, these Nazi students went in, um, or college students went in, and I mean, just completely gutted this uh, this institute. And, you know, over twenty-five thousand books and, and periodicals were burned. Um, and so we have that. We have some of that information because it became a target of, of the Nazis. Again, so much of what we have um, comes from the perspective of the perpetrators, which poses so many uh, right. ethical questions, but yeah. Right. Okay, I think that's the last of my German questions. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I feel like I have, we haven't turned from Sean in a while. So do we want to start <laughs> wrapping up? We'll start with Sean, and we can start anything we want to talk about that we haven't talked about so far, and then we can open it up to questions from the audience. Okay. All right, well then I'm going to... Yes, go <laughs> back, go back. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, so let's see. If it doesn't work this time, then you guys can like talk about me. This is what it's like to be, you know, an actual librarian research consultation. It's the actual experience here. Broken links, you know, we all if face these issues. Sorry, it's exactly. Right yeah, it's just <laughs> it's just a list of links, y'all. I didn't do anything special here, but I did want to talk about Salt Soul Sisters. So one of the things that we do, I'm reaching here, but I have a mic. Uh, one of the things we do, I think, as archivists nowadays, is we think about the conversation of access and what people. So once we did finally get the acquisition of the Salsa Soul collection, um, immediately the women were thinking, okay, great, so now you have our stuff. And this took 10 years. This was sort of post the 2010 event where I was like, um, here, black lesbians did exist. And then we were like, oh, right, we, you know, we need to put our stuff at LH, or we need to archive our stuff. And then I was convincing them for 10 years to archive with LHA. So they finally did. And then they were like, okay, great, so where's our book? Where's our website? Where's our, you know, street named after us? <laughs> All of these things. And I thought, well, you know, actually, like, it's sort of that conversation where to distill the silence, you must donate. You've donated, now what? But really, yeah. that's it. Like, your stuff is in a box, and someone might open it one day. Uh, like, that's yeah. really all they were promising. We're going to preserve your materials. And they were just like, ugh, the LHA, they take our things, they do nothing. This is what we mean about the feminists. You know, so we were just like, all right, first of all, Stop with the negativity. So we, but then of course I said I'm going to do it. We're going to do something. So we didn't exhibit, right? And a lot. And I was just at um, the sort of uh, is um, the historians' conference, national historians' conference, and I was on a panel of archivists, and everyone just immediately started talking about their exhibits. Like it's all about we're exhibit happy people. Mm. And I find that it's taking up too much time and energy for archivists personally to have to exhibit this material. But that's just my personal feeling. Having said that, the exhibit one is amazing. Um, a lot of people came, and so this is sort of, we, we connected with a gallery that we had already been working with to do exhibitions, um, and so this is just an, a way to show people that the, the material is in the archive, so they can come to the archive and just get a look at it. So what we did was I created this map on the wall, which then connected to the points um, of the flyers that we, so a lot of their material was flyers, they had a newsletter, it's also Gazette, um, and so these are like covers of the newsletter and special issues. They had, we have t-shirts at the collection, so we pulled that. We had some vitrines with specific ephemera. We had lots of photographs. Um, and then, I, of course, because it's a women of color uh, exhibition, we had an altar with names of the women who are now our ancestors who fought. So it was all really wonderful. Um, and just to show you some, I think I have a couple of post-exhibition photos. Um, the One of the women who is was the sort of um, exhibition, oh, no, 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 the editor-in-chief of their newsletter, the Salsa Soul Gazette, is now the wife of the mayor of New York. So, oh. Shirlane yeah. McRae is there, and that's me staring lovingly at her. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello. She looks good for her age. Uh, no, period. She looks good. All the women in the room, you would be very, thank you. I apologize. That's my daughter. No, so, so we also did a zine. Um, and the zine was through the Blackburn Gallery, and um, that was sort of part of the process, was getting things that people can hand out, and I didn't bring copies, I apologize. And these are the, a lot of the original Salsa Soul women who came. We had like multiple events, so this I think was maybe the opening. Um, and so 
again, beautiful women, lots of flirting was happening in that room. Um, <laughs> and it was, and we had three events throughout. So that was last June, thank goodness, because this June is so insane. But right now we're at the New York Historical Society, so we have a larger exhibition at New York Historical. Um, I got a grant to do an exhibition year for them. So we're sort of like lining it up. Brooklyn College, um, uh, Studio Museum of Harlem has some things in line, and then um, the Graduate Center. So we have like a calendar happening. All that is to say, it's exhausting. Um, I just wanted to put it in a box. But exhibitions are one way, I think, to really engage the community and get a lot of people in the room and talking and, and engaging with the material. So that was the last thing I wanted to make sure that I sh showed before. That's amazing. That the, yeah, that's it. That's and I'm going to use that as an opportunity to say, did you know we have a Stonewall 50 exhibit <laughs> in the Great Hall, which I'm sorry you can't see right now because it's closed, but come back tomorrow, come back Monday, come back during our regular hours. It's on the second floor of the Great Hall, and there are items from the Frank Kameny and Lily Vincennes collections. And so there's flyers from the first Gay Pride March, which a lot of people don't realize was a planned year it was the commemora commemoration of the one-year anniversary of Stonewall, which I think a lot of people don't realize that pride comes from yeah, that. Right, yeah, right. I think you're right. And they also don't know that Stonewall was a mafia-owned bar. That's another. Yeah. That's another hidden history. Oh, yeah, true. all gay bars at that time were mafia-owned. So, and then that feeds right into the police brutality. But sorry, sorry, I derailed that. But just wanted to promote myself for a moment. So, continue. <laughs> <laughs> so riffing on that, let me promote uh, ours. Uh, so yes. just a reminder, okay, so the Illegal to Be You exhibit is on, as you come in the mall entrance of the Museum of American History, on your right-hand side. It just went up yesterday. Please go and see it. Um, the documentary of Beyond Stonewall is on the SI channel Monday at 8 and 10 p.m., and then I think it's on Wednesday morning or something like that. Um, but then the last two things, which are maybe the more important, is, is that I charge you all to go home and clean out your closets. There's plenty of us to, I mean, we're, we're all in the same game here. So, and we all want to preserve it. So, it's on you. And then the other thing that's on you is to make sure that your institutions, you let them know that you want to see your history. I tell that all the time. Yeah. It's not that the Smithsonian or name, name any institution you want to doesn't want necessarily want to do it. It's that there's a gazillion and one things going on at any one day. But if you are a squeaky wheel, they will listen. That has, that's why the documentary got done. That's why we have a case up for um, Stonewall. And we're actually, speaking of pride, hopefully have an exhibit on pride next year to celebrate Ooh. the 50th anniversary of pride. Shh. Uh, okay. hasn't been approved yet, but I'm, I'm ever hopeful. We should so, collab. So if I leave you with nothing, those two things, most important. Yeah. Um, I also have an exhibit to plug, so you're right. We're all doing exhibits <laughs> now. Um, yes. A staff member did it. It is opening on the 28th, and it's at DC Art Center. It's not related directly to LGBTQ history, but it's a history of that art center. Um, and then DuPont I, was well. Hmm? DuPont as well, under Uprising. Oh, Stonewall yeah. 50. Meg and I are both. <laughs> we co curated an exhibit. <laughs> yeah, it's in the DuPont Which Underground. We about. Right yeah, now. we've been doing a lot this month. Do you see how she almost forgot that she co curated an exhibit with me? It has I been was a like, long time. I haven't June, done an exhibit, but someone else. No, yeah, you're right. Remember that time we went under the ground and we put the USBs in the projectors? Remember? Yeah. Okay, cool. I remember that. Cool. One of them is a little pixely. I need to go back and do it. It does take a lot of time. It really um, does. Yeah, the other thing I was just, I, I just wanted to mention on my little list of notes, um, the thing I discovered from the DC angle researching Stonewall was I feel like it's pushed as like Stonewall happened and then yeah. the next day everything was different. It's no. like, I'm, watch, I'm like going through this database <laughs> yeah. for the Washington Post and the Washington Evening Star looking for Stonewall and it's like, no. Not Nothing. Stonewall Jackson, not, not Stonewall right. Jackson. <laughs> Literally. It's not until like 1971 mm -hmm. was the first mention, and it was only because they were interviewing somebody who said, I got into activism because of Stonewall. It's only because people claim it that it becomes right. a turning yeah. point, and I exactly. think a lot of turning points, mm -hmm. it's really empowering it's to feel like, yeah, it's really yeah. empowering to feel like because somebody claims it, it becomes a turning point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Well, I do not have a, an exhibit to plug. <laughs> Come on. But I, I, I do have a, a story Get to share. I, I have a story to share. Um, right, so as I mentioned earlier, my the, the bulk of my research and writing focuses on what happened uh, to gay survivors in the gay community after the Holocaust, right? And so I, I, I began writing because I wanted to know how um, the pink triangle as a symbol, right, was a the, the badge that um, the Nazis forced gay uh, camp inmates to wear. How does that go from a concentration camp badge to then gay liberation uh, logo uh, in, in America, mm -hmm. right? So uh, across an ocean uh, and decades later. Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to trace down, everyone says, well, it just, it just was, like we just saw it. <laughs> yeah, but someone had to have the first one. Someone had to make that decision, right? Um, and so I, I go and, and through this network of the volunteer uh, archivists and, and historians, you know, find, okay, it's this one particular group uh, who claims that they were the first ones uh, to, to decide to use the pink triangle. But it turns out, of course, they actually heard the, uh, of a group in Berlin who was going to use it. And so like, they tried to get there first, talking about claiming uh, first, right? Uh, and so I end up, through kind of chance, um, talking with a guy who was at the meeting who, who proposed, at least according to him, he proposed that they use the pink triangle as, as a new gay logo, right? What year but, was this? Um, this is in West Berlin in 1972. Um, and they, this idea that you know being out was of course a personal liberation, but that it also needed to have a a, a, a political component, and so everyone needed to wear a, a gay logo of some sort. But they were like, well, what are we going to use? And so this guy says, well, we're going to use the pink triangle because clearly every German is going to recognize it as a concentration camp badge, and it's going to be kind of a symbol to them that. Uh, you know, th th there's still a big part of history that hasn't been dealt with, and in fact, the, the West German government, even at that time, was still using the Nazi law to arrest uh, gay men in, in West Germany. Wow. Uh, so that's a whole other story, yeah. right? So they wanted to fight kind of this Nazi law with a symbol of the Nazi past itself. So my question then to him is, well, how did you find, you know, what, what made you pick this, this symbol? Um, and he said, well, I, I came across this really obscure book uh, called The Men with the Pink Triangle. It was written by... Um, really the one, uh, at that time, the only gay uh, survivor autobiography. Um, turns out it was written under the pseudonym um, of Heinz Hager. Uh, but he said, as soon as I picked up that book and read you know, the title, The Men with the Pink Triangle, I, I knew like this was it. Like, this was going to be a simple symbol. It was going to be powerful. Um, and so, of course, then I did everything I could to try to find out who the real Heinz Hager was. Turns out it was a pseudonym. Uh, Yosef Kohut. So I, I, I try to, like every story that I tell, as you know, uh, giving talks at campuses or in my writing, I tell the story. Um, so now, last, several months ago, our museum opened up a new archive uh, up in Bowie, Maryland. Um, and and, and, and uh, in a way to kind of show it off to us staff, like they, they brought out some, um, some materials from the archives just to let us to come see and like see all the new technology. So I'm walking around. We're looking at all these, this random assortment of artifacts. And I come across this table where they have some badges laid out, some concentration camp badges. Uh, and I'm looking and I see one number that just completely jumps out at me. And so I'm like, okay, hold on. So then I'm getting on my phone and I'm looking up. It was Josef Kohut's badge on the wow. table. It was Heinz Hager's badge, oh my God. right? Wow. It was literally the pink triangle that wow. he wrote the book about that then inspired that activist group to choose it uh, and then you know set set the stage for its its expansion uh, and even when I talk about it I still get chill bumps yeah, right wow. um, and and it, it's just an incredible sometime accident of, of history and research you know it, it's um, wow that's incredible well thank you so much to our panelists this evening let's give them a round of applause Now, questions from the audience, and we'll repeat the questions into the microphone since it's being recorded. So, who's got questions for us? For anyone or for the panel at large? Um, my question is if during the time of Stonewall, mm -hmm. did people refer to themselves as gay, straight? Mm -hmm. Or, oh, you know, this word homosexual, I mean, we're still homosexuals, aren't we all? And where, where did yes. lesbians come from? You know, aren't they gay and homosexual too? And 
I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, is there a difference between then and now? Are we still using these same words? Yes and no, I think. Does anyone want to jump in? Um, I can speak a little bit to it. All right, go for it. Uh, um, so so the, the term homosexual comes into vogue in the latter part of the 19th century as a medical term, a pathology, as opposed to something that's positive. Um, the idea that um, the community is is recognized as gay, which is pan, pan, whatever, you know, whether you're the L, the G, the B, the T. Um, and even now, when that was a big discussion when we were doing the labels for the exhibit is, mm. you know, okay, it is the gay community and everybody will understand what we mean by that because otherwise the labels were starting to get this big. Um, then the other thing, of course, um, you're, are you British, by the way? Or? I was one. Well, okay. <laughs> Okay, so so you would you could tell us about the origins of the phrase the friend of Dorothy, right? That's more of a I've been told that's more of a British mm. term in the sense that you know you would walk up to a gentleman that you probably have been cruising hopefully, and just say, oh, are you a friend of Dorothy? And you go, oh yes, or Dorothy who? You know, so <laughs> then you turn around and run the other way. So um, so it's so it's still it's still rather fluid. I mean, in the museum the kind of the, what I call the catch-all LGBT collection, because it's a, a lot of ephemera and stuff, that small things that people hand me. It's, it's the LGBT collection, we, and I stopped at T because that's where we were at that time. I, you know, so at some point, I, you, you know, you kind of got to figure what's going to fit on the label. Is, uh, I added Q but, and a plus when I got here. Did you? Yeah, I there did. you go. Yeah, we, we sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll venture into the plus. But, yeah. um, it can take a while, though, with institutions to get yeah. them to change it, though, yeah. But, but um, yeah. And, and maybe more specifically, the, the term gay, the one piece of evidence that I've seen uh, that is really interesting to me is there's a photograph from a gentleman in World War II, and on the back of the, the, his photograph he goes, um, you know, this is me and wherever the heck he was, you know, gay as hell still and loving it as if it was a passing fantasy or something. But um, that's, that's the first <laughs> reference I've seen in, in our collections to you know, calling yourself gay and that meaning that he was a homosexual. Mm -hmm. So hopefully yeah. that's a little bit enlightening. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, more questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I appreciate the... Okay, just wait. <laughs> you know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <coughs> yes, uh, I appreciate the urgency and uh, the desire to collect materials. Uh, but at the same time, we all know we can't collect everything. Right. 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 And also yeah. there's power to leaving collections within the communities of origin and archivists now are exploring post-custodial means of oh. um, creating relationships between individuals and communities and uh, institutions and I wonder if you could speak to those kinds of relationships where you go to certain communities and individuals where it's not about collecting but it's about building those kinds of relationships because sometimes in some areas of our community, once you go there with that agenda of collecting, yeah. then the conversation stops because we don't want to be collected, mm -hmm. but we want to have a relationship. So I just wonder if you could speak yeah. to those kinds of relationships. Wow, that's a great question. Anyone feel like jumping in? I know you have I something like to say, Sean. I know, I I know it, you but do. But I feel like it sort of doesn't apply. To, or it applies in it from a different angle. Like I totally 100% agree with you, and I think that that is a conversation that I bring up when I think about concepts of open access and mm -hmm. all access. Right. And some things are meant to be closed. Some things are meant to be sustained within a specific group and within a community. And I'm always interested in starting from that perspective, right? And so I think for community archives, which are few and far between. There is that element of trust within the community to maintain the community's archive. If you're speaking about geographic communities or ethnic communities, or ultimately it's about self-ascribed communities, right? Like if you're a part of a group, whether it's a church community or a specific ethnic group of a specific geographic location, Southern Dykes or what, whoever your community is, the goal and the hope is that that community has the interest right, to do self-archiving and the resources and the means to do that. So in some ways, what's been happening with queer community archives is a lot of them have been collaborating with institutions because of the preservation conversation. Like, you know, it takes a lot of work and it takes space, it takes Money. real estate, right? It's, it's, Trust. 
Yeah, so, so the trust happens with the community archive and then the assumption is if that community archive has worked with an institution to preserve the work that they're collect collecting in the community, then that's in some ways what the trend is right now. Mm -hmm. And as long as the community, is, uh, the community archive is transparent about how institutions are absorbing the material to the individuals that are donating it, I think that that is okay because you know, in 100 years, we're all not going to be here to know whether or not that happened. And so we want the materials to still be here. Um, I'm not, I don't necessarily think that only institutions can sustain materials, um, but it does take a really strong community-based archival practice for it to sustain further than an institution. So whether or not there are collectives of people that are making that happen, it really depends on the community. So I, I have a real life story, and I'll, um, out of respect to the people that I'll be talking about, I will not use names. But um, so we had um, may, reached out to this community, and certainly just in conversations, and they had donated material. Uh, but they were they were a part of a group, a very very old and respected group within the Washington community, um, and uh, both of these people were were well. One of them was just a dyed in the wool archivist. I mean, just a wannabe, and you know, catalog everything, you know, everything box, just perfect, <laughs> like, just as you want for this community. Well, the community died out, so he finally, you know, he knew us. He came to us and he says, you know, we're ready to turn this over now. So I, so I guess that's kind of the way that I like to approach it because what what always worries me is it goes in the dumpster when that that one person and every organization yeah. has one who's really into like making sure that everything's filed or at least put in a box and it's you know not in the basement with the water it's you know and that sort of thing but then when that person goes away is it a burden for the community it's like oh well I you know I don't have room in my house for that so so it's it's a it's a fine line isn't it can I add also, I sure. think one sort of intermediary step right now would be archival projects mm -hmm. where that are potentially digital. So it's mm -hmm. not about people bestowing their boxes of stuff to mm -hmm. another person's basement, but it's about sort of coll collecting the story, right? So there's a lot of um, online oral history projects that are um, being coordinated by probably a public library. Um, mm -hmm. New York Public Library has a really robust one. There's the Trans Oral History Project as an example. But I'm also thinking of a practice that StoryCorps does, and since the Library of Congress is where they're housed, once upon a time I was archive coordinator for StoryCorps, and one of my positional purposes was to work with community archives. And what I appreciated and learned a lot about that process was, you know, StoryCorps would perform the interview. StoryCorps is a um, national oral history project. Um, where sometimes the, pro the oral histories would happen at an organization or in a specific geographic location. Um, and so those were sort of like the door-to-door -door interviews. Uh, facilitators would go in, two people who knew each other would have a conversation, and then that um, conversation would be archived at the Library of Congress. So whenever that happened at a specific site or with a specific community group, that community group got a copy of the material. So then there were two separate you know, these things existed in both places. And that was often a way to respect that this community needed to have access to their stuff. They're not going to fly to DC to listen to their um, interview. So the individual people would have a copy, and then the community would have a copy. Um, and so I think that that model is a really great example of how things can be preserved and also maintained within space. And just, and now that you mentioned that, you reminded me that the, with the same group that I was chatting about, he actually bless his heart, took it on, he digitized everything that anybody wanted, and so we got the, we got the actual stuff to preserve it and to make sure, make it accessible, but then they have a digital copy. So, so you're right, right. That's, that's kind of a media, media stuff. I think that's similar with the Digital Transgender Archive, which it is, it's an archival project, KJ Rawson, and I'm not sure who else worked on it, but they've digitized items from institutions all over the place and are putting it together in one repository, but at the, sa at the end of the day, you know, the items still are still living in Internet Archive or wherever they've been digitized. But uh, this is another really good example of one of those projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, I guess get two of them might be a little controversial to bear with me. Number one, just figure out what the origin of... So we'll figure out what the origin of the word gay. It used to be happy and... The word used to be ha mean happy and merry, you know, mm -hmm. might even theme parks and, you know, the gay way and sure, all that stuff. Sure. But I've learned how, how it came to be used uh, instead of homosexual laws, more of that. Okay. And number two, 
a little bit controversial, but just bring it out there. Is do, do you do you actually catalog anti-gay religious right literature as oh, well? Yeah. We oh absolutely. Oh, oh, very good. All the Thank time. We, yes. Yeah, Thanks. I mean that's um, <laughs> to speak speak to the gay thing. The, what what I was uh, told in, in the history was that um, yet again it was another code word that um, let's say you you were you know met somebody and, and you know how are you oh I'm feeling very gay today just you know because it did mean happy but then in the underground it meant perhaps something else mm -hmm. but then um, to speak to the other we're yes actively always collecting the other side of the coin because you have to um, yeah you have to uh, and I always tell people I says you know in 50 years 100 years whenever when let's say marriage equality is kind of you know you know a big snooze you know and people go what was all the screaming about you can actually say see this is what was going on this is what we were fighting against you need so, both sides oh yeah you've got yeah very hard to collect though isn't it it is yeah yeah they just don't want to give it up Sorry. jose i just i just want to thank you it's a wonderful panel and one wonderful colleagues um Introduce I, yourself, Jose. Yeah. We know who you are. I think a lot of people know. Uh, you should, yeah, know, you should know who you are. Jose Gutierrez, and I'm a local uh, historian and arch archivist. Mm -hmm. um, I just buy some uh, part of the collection uh, four years ago of uh, Jose Sarria. Uh, who was the first uh, gay American man who ran for a political office in San Francisco in 1963, I believe. So. He donated most of the his archives to the San Francisco Library, I mean, LGBTQ yeah. Museum. But I buy like 71 or 72 items, and I'm, I'm very happy to have it in DuPont Circle. <laughs> and I also bring up a picture of Sylvia Rivera. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here I, she is. Yeah. Here she is. I met, I met Sylvia Rivera uh, 25 years ago in New York City. Actually, when was the um, Stonewall 25th anniversary? And you know, uh, Sylvia and Marcia Johnson, you know, they create a lot of projects and programs in New York City, um, including STAR. Um, I believe in 1969 or 1970, uh, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionary, something like that. And, um, you know, my meetings, my conversations with Sylvia, you know, she was very humble and, and, and they did a lot of things, they you sure know, did. they know, I mean, we know just a little bit things of, 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 of what we know of Stonewall, but Marcia and Sylvia, they were, you know, everywhere. Um, so I, I just thank you and, and anytime that you need anything related to the Latinx LGBTQ community, I will be more than happy to work with anyone and uh, thank you, thank you for, for, for this panel. And thank you. Thank you and yeah. what a great picture. What oh, amazing. Amazing. Oh, <laughs> Look at the baby. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my goodness. Yeah. Um, all right. Oh, don't. Question. Hi. Uh, one conversation. Hi. Lee? Uh, yeah. Lee? Lee? <laughs> Wait. Oh, my goodness. We used to work at the same library. Oh my God, you're here! Hi. <laughs> uh, hi. So, a conversation I've been having a lot, uh, particularly this year, but recently, is the commercialization of Pride. Uh, um, sorry. And so I'm curious. I'm curious if you have folks at your institutions have seen anything like that. Any uh, more corporations purchasing licenses, interest in partnerships, grants, oh, anything yeah. like that on your end? Well, well, especially in D.C., right? Yeah. Like, our pride is so corporate. Yeah. Um, I think here, because we're not like NYPL, we don't have the, the images online from that time period, but I know that they've all been getting, like, mad requests for, oh, we're going to publish this book, we're going to put this on a beer can, we're going to do this. I think it's different for us as government, or, or for me as a government uh, librarian, but I definitely have heard from others in the field that they are quite overwhelmed and not quite sure what to do about all the private interest in, in this and what, what the potential use for that would be. Yeah, what about you? What you um, as I mentioned, Comcast is, is helping fund the digital hub. Um, as far as the corporatization of Pride, that is a fascinating subject to me and I, every time I collect from as many Prides as I can get to, and, I, and it's amazing to see the material that 
that is coming out of corporate headquarters. And yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't bring a flash drive tonight. Sorry, <laughs> but um, but my one of my favorite things that I collected this year at DC Pride was a poster developed by the CIA of all people <laughs> to recruit yes Stop. yes to recruit LGBT <laughs> people yes it is awesome it's 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 so 1940s film noir and yet there's a rainbow it's amazing it'll be in the exhibit next year yeah i yeah. just because i mean i think most people know the CIA the FBI they actively yes. investigate yeah. gay rights groups and have forever right. so that's very interesting yeah. well all three of them were at the there. <laughs> secret service was there FBI CIA was there and yeah, all oh. of them, all of them. Welcome to well, DC. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> right. All right. Can I um, also say, I don't know if you are aware of the New York City has World Pride this year. Mm -hmm. but, I've uh, heard of that. Which I'm not, nobody really understands what that means. But all that we know is that Heritage of Pride is the organization that usually does the Pride March. And this year, Heritage of Pride sort of either stepped down or works with or has been working with this other group called World Pride and that they've come to us, they've come to New York City, so now World Pride is in New York City for the first time ever, which is what, that's the, that's oh, the slogan. Oh, it's the first time. So, um, I don't know if it's the first time there's a World Pride, but it's the first time it's in New York City. They wanted it to be in New York for the 50. Which is right. sort of like, I feel like why they started, right, right, to be in New York for 50. So there's, I'm talking every night of the week, there's like multiple events, yeah. and each of the archives in New York City has been tapped out of our bloodstream <laughs> to participate in every single thing that we can, and so it is definitely um, something that's happening. What has also happened as a result of it is Reclaim Pride, which is the Reclaim Pride March. So I was gonna pull mm -hmm. up the no, link, but you can, pride locally. you can look, uh, yeah, it's reclaimpridenyc.org. So a lot of the actual groups that are working Pride or that work in Pride for, you know, beyond Stonewall 50, have stepped away from work walking in the march, and so now everyone's walking in Reclaim Pride. So it's, yeah. it's going to be walking alongside the march on 6th <laughs> Avenue, while the march is on 5th oh. Avenue. And it's, of course, you know, the day after the Dyke March, which never has a permit, and it's going to walk around right. Fifth Avenue. So I think that New York City, in some ways, there's, like, all the, you know, millions of tourists that are going to come in and, like, celebrate Pride, and then there are the people who are, like, reclaiming it, which, how fun, you know, like, yeah. at the end of the day. Right. Right. Um, I will. Some people are going to do reclaim and then, like, run over to Fifth Avenue and still, yeah. like, you know, I don't really know what's going to come of it. We'll see. But a lot of groups have created statements and thought about, like, how corporate entities are entering the space and how it's all politicized and that sort of thing. Having said that, when it comes to the archives, and that was sort of what we were alluding to with the Gale um, collaboration, is that um, there, was, there was a woman who, Rebecca, Rebecca Sheffield, uh, wrote her dissertation on how uh, LGBT archives are re re um, relying on institutional or corporate support, and that is the future of LGBT archiving, and that there is an ethical question about that, and so I would recommend if you're interested in that question to look at her dissertation. She's a librarian. I think she's now somewhere in, I don't know, New England area in, New York, um, in this country. But one of the things that she used LHA as an example, and I was sort of like enraged. There's no way we're not relying on institutions. And then it turns out, well, yeah, Gail gave us a really nice check for the royalties um, for the the digitization that they did of our microfilm that they already had in their microfilm. So when they did nice. the microfiche, we got maybe like two thousand dollars a year, and it didn't do wow. much, but like pay the water bill. And then they digitized the microfilm, didn't let us know about it. We had to go back into contract with them to renegotiate, and then we got a substantial portion of the royalties. And because they're making who knows how much. LHA has received enough that we can endow ourselves so that the founders can there actually go. retire, yeah. right? Woo! So in some ways, it's like, well, it's sustaining an organization that the community relies on, and many people who donate to LHA have been donating for the past 30 years, and they're not going to be able to do that forever, and although we want them to put us in their will and keep us sustaining, and although we don't have any staff because it's volunteer run, there is a question of sustainability that we do have that I think financial support is necessary and if corporations are going to participate in that and allow access to the material dot 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 <laughs> <laughs> right it's a conversation that you know it's sort of like can we as a community move the corporation aside and then match it probably not, probably not. so I'm not adverse to the relationship I do think that we take many steps to make sure that it isn't unethical. We redact and redact and redact everything that we, th like right now they're digitizing all of our organizational files. 
and we made sure before that happened that we were able to hire a lesbian to go through it and train that person and she go through each sheet of paper and redact everything that shouldn't be put online. So there's definitely a lot of care and attention put into it, even though it is, you know, a corporation. It's not open access. Right. It's closed. Yeah, it's not that. Maybe I feel like you know, a lot of us think of a lot of us think of those, you know, our archives and that kind of public history as going very hand in hand. Makes sense to be in that open access, freely available to all. But right, that yeah. How do you balance that issue of being able to sustain a, something and make it accessible? Yeah. But it's also uh, it's an interesting, maybe a good problem to have, right? How much of your money can I take and still feel good about it? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I end with one last thing? Um, sure. Because you, something you mentioned earlier about the, the Stonewall effect got me thinking about, um, and we're talking about these these marches and the the relationship between, for example, you know, a large these large parades uh, and public policy. You know, or um, you know, changing the the mainstream community's um, understanding of, of the LGBT community, uh, but also there's sometimes very clear uh, relationships between these types of, of marches and history or, or scholarship, right? Um, and so I have uh, it made me think of one um, example that actually the day um, that or the weekend that the Holocaust Museum opened up uh, in April of 1993. Um, it just so happened that it was also the same weekend as the 1993 National March on Washington for Lesbian uh -huh. Gay yeah. by Equal Rights. Yeah. Um, and so suddenly, you know, we're, we're, our museum is opening up on the National Mall and then there's like tens or hundreds <laughs> of thousands of not just gay people, but like gay politically, historically minded people coming through this museum wanting to find, you know, look for themselves in this museum. Um, and so, you know, we had like one plaque, like one little bit on, you know, that yes, gay people were there, they were persecuted too, uh, which, you know, so it was not a whole lot, but I will just say that no other national um, Holocaust museum in the world even acknowledged that there were gay people in the Holocaust. Wow. Um, so at least that, I mean, that was, that was something, right? But um, clearly the, the museum rightfully uh, got a lot of criticism for not having enough information uh, on on this particular group, um, and one thing that I'm I'm, I'm pretty proud of uh, for of the institution is that instead of trying to like defend itself and say, well, you know, making up some excuses, uh, the leadership said, yeah, you're right. Like we don't have a lot on there, uh, but it's because there's not a lot of history written about it, at least not in English. Uh, and so essentially, they uh, raised some money and then, then funded like a, an entire wave of scholarship on uh, the persecution of gay people during the Holocaust. Um, to help fill, you know help fill that gap, um, and so I think that you know sometimes we, or at least I personally think about the political ramifications of these big types of marches, but in some cases it very clearly has an impact on how history itself is written as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we have time for one last question, and you're it. <laughs> uh, following up on that, I'm curious as to whether or not. Uh, the influence of like the Spielberg Holocaust uh, oral history. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to acquire tapes that would relate to um, the the gay situation and, and there as well, at the concentration camps? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting um, topic, right? Um, because so we we have been able to go back through and and start watching some of those videos uh, and, but unfortunately, there's not at least when they were first created, they weren't they weren't tagged. As like this interview includes a gay topic, right? Oh wow! Um, and so then us having to watch it and go back and then retag it and say, oh wait, that person actually is talking about a gay relationship or a gay experience. Um, but all that compounded on the fact that you know, in order to even get an, an interview, number one, you had to have an interviewer who was willing to talk about those types of issues, uh, and then you had to have an interviewee who was also willing to to talk about it, um, which whether it's you know gay, straight men or women, usually the topic of sexuality at all uh, was not broached during these types of interviews because it was you know not proper. Um, the issue, for example, of of, of rape or or forced um, sex is something that's only just now being studied uh, in the context of the Holocaust of Holocaust history because clearly we know it happened, 
uh, but interviewees, interviewers themselves didn't even want to ask questions of, of people right. about it. Um, and so while, while we, we can tap those types of interviews, um, it's, it's, you're really having to kind of read between the lines in, in a lot of cases. Absolutely, yeah. We're we're um, we're always open to uh, you know filming new new oral history testimonies. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think that brings us to time. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Take a bookmark. Send me an email. Have a good ALA.